times are changing. Our ladies can do stuff now. Yeah, yeah. You know when you think something's going to be funny and you say it and then you actually panic about it, which is what I did because fans started guessing who it might be and they were guessing people like Benedict Cumberbatch or Patrick Stewart and I was thinking... <laughs> My God, that's a good idea. <laughs> and they're going to be so disappointed when they find out it's me. NerdErotic.com. WandaVision had such a promising start, but ultimately it ended in disappointment. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, and so have many others. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. Just ask any woman on the planet. Initially, on the surface, WandaVision looked like an ambitious show, especially for the homogenous Disney+, Plus, which we will from now on call D+. It started out a little bit Legion, which was, in the beginning, a very good show, but it ended up being like Iron Man 2 with the morals of Wonder Woman 1984. Now, does my disappointment stem from fan theories or fan theorizing? No, not at all. Now, I'm not the kind of person who theorizes, but that's what you want fans doing, and in the beginning, that's what was succeeding about this show? You got me to crack open old Avengers comics, watch some older MCU films. God, they're older MCU films now. That's how long it's been around. So no, you can't blame the fans for being disappointed. It's pretty well earned. The Disney hype train was on. They announced this show with Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness back in 2019. And they insinuated heavily that this would lead directly into that sequel, which it did not do. It's a light prequel at the very best and it's not the fans fault that their theories were better than anything we got on the screen and yes elizabeth olsen did insinuate that there would be a luke skywalker like cameo and that ended up being evan peters as boner and we will definitely talk about that it was the story that failed in the end and some characters that outright didn't belong in this show and some characters who ripped me right out of it now, of course, it's a tale of two shows. That's what it's supposed to be. The only problem is the other show within this show is what took me out of the show. Now, there are going to be some spoilers, but I'm not going to go over every detail, although I probably could because this was a film that was stretched over nine very short episodes with insanely long credits. There was some good, there was some bad, there was some mediocre, and there was some MCU. What's the MCU? You mean aside from Captain Marvel? Well, it started in Ant-Man and Wasp, which should be called Wasp and Ant-Man. Just take a look at that poster. Ant-Man was a buffoon in his entire movie. Then we had the A-Force scene in Avengers Endgame, which was completely ridiculous. Of course, we had that awful Captain Marvel movie. And now we have WandaVision, a show I have changed my mind on so many times. I'm right there with you, drinker. I started liking it at first. Now that I've seen the whole thing and seen the context, I think it's all terrible. The performances far outshine the writing in this. And Elizabeth Olsen was good as Wanda Maximoff and now Scarlet Witch officially. And Paul Bettany is great as the Vision. And they had pretty good chemistry together, but that was about it. And when they separated in those last two episodes, it really showed a lot of the flaws and we will get to those flaws. I will tell you exactly why I don't like this show and I don't like the direction the MCU is going in. And I really don't like the structure and format of Disney plus. I think it's a flat out rip off. Now the first three episodes did a really good job matching the aesthetic of each respective sitcom that they were paying homage to, but that was it. Nothing else happened. We were slowly being introduced to our cast of characters, which I thought would have much more impact. There was Herb, Phil Jones, Mr. and Mrs. Hart, and of course, Anya from Buffy. It was great seeing Emma Caulfield playing Dottie Jones, but they ended up just being people in the town that Wanda was torturing. The most impactful thing that happened in the first episode was at the end when we saw a mysterious woman watching WandaVision on TV. And in the second episode, we got a drone in color and the beekeeper who disappeared completely from the rest of the show. And it just ended up being sword observing them. We were also introduced to Geraldine who would eventually become Monica Rambeau. She helped deliver Tommy and Billy who will eventually become Wiccan 
and speed of the Young Avengers. And, of course, we know she was brought into Wanda's world because subconsciously Wanda knew she would be an ally. And that's the exact language they used. You trusted me to help deliver your babies. On some level, Wanda, you know I am an ally. <laughs> After the third episode, the mystery box kicks in. The good old mystery box, a product of one of my favorite repurposers in Hollywood, Jar Jar Abrams. It is meant to make a story look a lot more complex than it really is. A great example of what mystery box does is what WandaVision did in episode three and four. It showed you the same story from two different perspectives, but they both ended up in the same place. Sure, we got to know more about Monica Rambeau, who ended up being nothing to this story by the time it ended other than being really powerful. Along with the mystery box comes the unreliable narrator. These stories can work over long periods of time, but we are talking about a one-off series that was only supposed to be nine episodes that could have been a lot shorter. In the beginning, the introduction to Monica Rambeau was pretty damn good. We see her in the hospital, and she's just coming back to from the snap. We see the chaos, and I was fascinated by this part. We find out that her mom died of cancer and that she missed it. She had fallen asleep in the hospital and woke up five years later. Now, I have huge problems with the five-year gap and the snap. That's a video for another day. Now, this is where the problems started creeping in, but it wasn't that bad at first. Monica Rambeau goes back to work, and it turns out her mom, Maria Rambeau, built sword from scratch. Apparently, she went to Home Depot, bought herself a tool set, and built that place from the ground up. We learned this through a brief conversation between Monica Rambeau and our new character, Director Hayward, who will now be known as Director Toxic Male. In that conversation, Director Toxic Male apologizes for his very existence while he's telling Monica Rambeau how great she really is. Monica Rambeau is assigned a missing persons case in New Jersey that she decides to take, and she meets Jimmy Woo from Ant-Man, and this is where the mystery starts to deepen. To round out our plucky little diverse team, we're introduced to Kat Denning's character, from Thor, who I can't even be bothered to remember the name of, and it appears her only existence in this show is to annoy the entire audience. Seriously, after watching WandaVision all the way through three times, I'm not sure why she was there other than we need women in STEM. Honestly, I'm a STEM type of lady. Do you want an example of MCU? Well, here you go. Uh, she could have taken out Thanos on her own if he hadn't initiated a blitz. I mean, nobody else came close. Well, I'd argue that Captain Marvel came close. And if my aunt had gonads, she'd be my uncle. Aside from that being one of the many dumb lines in this series, this is how the MCU destroys the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In two short lines, you cut the balls off of your biggest villain and you make the Avengers look like a bunch of idiots. Thor came pretty close too last time I checked. And you make your beloved Captain Marvel look like a selfish bitch. She ended up taking off half the time when she could have ended this whenever she wanted. Yes, it's just as bad as Nick Fury losing his eye to a little kitty cat. I'm sure that's exactly the kind of thing Jack Schaefer would find hilarious. So, we have two Avengers trapped in a sitcom world along with thousands of other people in a town that doesn't exist. We find out that S.W.O.R.D. has set up operations outside what they call the Anomaly. Now, the big mystery was supposed to be who trapped Wanda Maximoff in this town. They were making it look like there was somebody else behind it, especially when Wanda at one point says, I have no idea how I got here. Now, there were little hints that it could have been Mephisto, but a lot of that was fan projection. They were alluding to some deeper mysteries that never really fleshed out for me anyway. There was no children in the town, and during the magic show in the second episode, there was that for the children part. And again, that made it look like it might have been Mephisto, or at least somebody like Nightmare, but oh, we find out what happened to the children, and we will get into that. But I want you to think about the morals of Wonder Woman 1984. Remember when Wonder Woman raped the guy? Yeah, it's about that bad. But it couldn't have been Mephisto. You want to know why? Jack Schaefer, the showrunner for WandaVision, the writer for the upcoming Black Widow, and the contributor 
to Captain Marvel had no idea who Mephisto was until she started doing press for WandaVision. Schaefer stated, There was never any conscious intention on my part to create any Mephisto red herrings because I didn't know who Mephisto was until I started doing press. <laughs> oh, M. She, you. Everything fell apart after the Evan Peters cameo, and again, you cannot blame the fans for coming up with better ideas than the people who are actually paid to tell us this story on a premium streaming service. Even the quote-unquote creatives involved in making this show knew they were in for trouble. More on that later. One of the many problems with mystery box storytelling is when your mystery isn't that mysterious when the audience catches on long before the writers intended for them to catch on and the audience has to sit around and wait while the characters and story catch up to them according to showrunner jack schaefer wandavision is a character study in a woman's grief which i would buy and think was compelling if there was a basis for this relationship outside of one flashback scene in this series and a three-minute scene in Avengers Infinity War. Other than that, there's nothing. Even if this was the Vision and Scarlet Witch relationship from the comics, it wouldn't justify Wanda Maximoff enslaving thousands of people and torturing children, which will affect them for the rest of their lives. We reviewed every individual episode on Friday Night Tights, and up until the last Last one, I was intrigued, but it was that final episode that makes this entire series a complete waste of time. So we eventually find out what's going on, and quite frankly, what you guys came up with was much better than what Jack Schaefer came up with. Wanda Maximoff woke up sad one day and wanted to say goodbye to what was left of Vision's body, which was being disassembled on his orders from his will. She says her goodbyes, then goes to a house that Vision purchased for her because they were going to move in together after a three-week relationship. What are they, lesbians? And she was so upset, she created a new Vision, a house, a couple of kids, and enslaved thousands of people and hundreds of children because she was grieving. Everything director Toxic White Male was doing made absolute sense up until this point. He was protecting the thousands of people in that town. And we got incredible lines like this. You don't bother me, I won't bother you. I wish it could be that simple. You've taken an entire town hostage. Well, I'm not the one with the guns, director. Yes, he has guns. You have enslaved thousands of people and hundreds of children. Turns out director Toxic White Male was evil after all, and he had a master plan. First, he hired an effects team to create some fake footage of Wanda Maximoff stealing Vision's body, which she didn't do. Director Toxic White Male was illegally reassembling Vision for S.W.O.R.D. The next part of this evil master plan was to frame Wanda Maximoff for creating Vision. Then he would have his Vision kill her vision and Wanda Maximoff, the government would thank him for recovering a valuable asset and he wouldn't get in trouble for illegally reassembling vision. But if Wanda didn't go crazy and create this town, what was his big plan to cover up the fact that he illegally reassembled vision? There was a little hitch in director Toxic White Male's evil plan. He didn't know how to turn Vision on, but luckily, when he tried to kill Wanda with a 1980s drone in the second or third episode, there was some residual Wanda Maximoff magic on it. Ugh. And he was able to use that residual Wanda Maximoff magic to turn on the toxic white Vision. Now, the organization of S.W.O.R.D., which was originally from Astonishing X-Men, written by Joss Whedon, and it was supposed to be an offshoot of S.H.I.E.L.D., was presented in WandaVision like a military organization run by a Hollywood writer's room filled with Marin soccer moms. And WandaVision gave us brilliant examples of writing like this. She's holding thousands of people hostage. And it could have been thousands more. <laughs> then, of course, there is Agnes, who we all knew was Agatha Harkness from the first episode, yet the show was treating it like it was a big mystery, and apparently it was Agatha all along. Now, Agatha Harkness originally was Franklin Richards' babysitter and a mentor to the Scarlet Witch in the comics, but in this show, 
they decided to make her a lot younger and she steals magic from other magic users. Now, I don't know how she got into the town where Wanda had enslaved a bunch of people. Apparently, she was just following Wanda Maximoff around until she decided to do something extremely powerful. She brings with her a little book called The Darkhold, which is from the comics, but we get a little more MCU here in this book. They prophesize the coming of the Scarlet Witch, the destroyer of worlds, a sorcerer more powerful than the Sorcerer Supreme. And they end up cutting the nuts off of Doctor Strange before his sequel even goes into production. Well done. Now, they completely retconned Agatha Harkness from the comic books, but her character being present in this show is what led a lot of people who have read comics to believe that there might be an appearance from Mephisto or Magneto or other Avengers, but we now know that wasn't the case. Aside from not knowing who Mephisto was, Jack Schaefer also admitted that she doesn't know how to read comic books. I'm not a very good comic book reader. I have a hard time digesting the storylines, and I never know which cell to look at, and I don't know. I'm a disappointment, perhaps, to the fandom in that way. But the imagery is always, of course, very startling and moving, even though I don't know how to read it, and inspiring. And it was Kevin Feige's idea to marry Wanda and Vision to the sitcom world. Then there's Vision, one of the most intelligent characters in the comics and the Marvel Cinematic Universe, being completely clueless for this entire series. About halfway through the show, he makes it through the barrier and he sees that there's a military organization there and he asks them for help. And then he spends the rest of the series just kind of meandering around while they play out the sitcom element of the show that started fading out around halfway through. We did Full House, Malcolm in the Middle, and we ended with Modern Family. But one of the worst things in this show was a scene between Kat Denning and Vision. And thanks to Mahler for initially pointing this out in an EFAP we did. I think it ended up running about 10 hours. Link will be in the description. Mahler pointed out that this should have been the most emotionally impactful scene in the series when Kat Denning is telling Vision how he died and she's filling him in on his past and they ended up just making it a joke. This brings us to Evan Peters' Quicksilver. Obviously, he is the one from the X-Men films. That's what was stated in the audio description of this show. Did Agatha Harkness accidentally pull the wrong Quicksilver from another reality or across the multiverse because she couldn't perform necromancy on the Pietro in the MCU because his body was on another continent? Or was there a guy in the town who just happened to look like Evan Peters named Boner? And yes, Wanda just accepts Boner as her brother and the reason given in the show was because she was grieving. Now, if Agatha Harkness can just pick any and give him Quicksilver's powers or anybody's powers, why go through all this trouble? Why not give Boner the powers of Doctor Strange and he could figure out how she was practicing that magic that she didn't know how to do? And then, sorry if I sound like a broken record, because this is mystery box storytelling, everything stops in the penultimate episode and we get Wanda Maximoff's backstory. Was this the moment where they introduce the mutants into the MCU? Not really. We do find out that Wanda Maximoff had her powers from birth and it was the Infinity Stone that enhanced them. Her parents lived in Sokovia. That part wasn't changed. And we finally get an answer to the sitcom element of the show. Turns out her dad sold sitcom DVDs in the war-torn Sokovia for a living and the ones he didn't sell they would watch so each episode and some of the commercials was just wanda processing her grief now a couple of the commercials didn't really make sense especially the nexus commercial which was the biggest red herring of this show the nexus is a cross-dimensional gateway to the multiverse in the marvel comics but they don't refer to this at all. Then there's the Monica Rambeau storyline, which again, went absolutely nowhere, but her story goes something like this. She's smart. She's sassy. She breaks a lot of rules. She had a billion dollar truck made to her exact specifications within 24 hours to get through the barrier. Truck doesn't work, but that's okay because she's awesome. She's going to walk through the barrier by herself. And when she comes out the other side, she's going to be a superhero. That's right. Monica Rambeau becomes a superhero by breaking a barrier while being positively affirmed. I'm thinking 
hoping there's some kind of message that I might be missing here because I just don't care. So Monica risks her life to break through the barrier, becomes a superhero, and does absolutely nothing. She gets into an argument with Wanda. She gets caught by Boner. Then she escapes Boner. Then she saves a couple of fake kids and lets the villain go. Now everything is set up for the big superhero battle at the end. We have Toxic White Vision versus Wanda's Vision. And we have Agatha Harkness versus the Scarlet Witch. We have the men fighting the men and the women fighting the women because we can't have men fighting women, but we can have women fighting men as long as they don't fight back. Wanda's vision transfers his memories into toxic white vision, which of course is the rebuilt original vision by director toxic white male. And he becomes vision. And then he does what all men do leaves in the fight with Agatha Harkness. Wanda gets to see how much trauma she has put the townspeople through and she decides to let them go. And they all leave without their children. Agatha Harkness and Scarlet Witch exchange purple and red energy balls for a little while, and then Scarlet Witch defeats Agatha with magic she didn't know how to use five minutes earlier. Sword breaks in through the crack in the barrier. They fight Tommy and Billy, and director Toxic White Male decides to shoot a couple of fake children, but they are saved by the stunning and brave and empowered Monica Rambeau. Scarlet Witch defeats Agatha Harkness and imprisons her back into her character of the nosy neighbor forever until she needs her for some magical advice. Director Toxic White Male is arrested. I'm not quite sure why the rest of S.W.O.R.D., who was fully aware of what they were doing, weren't arrested, but whatever. So in the end, Wanda finally decides to do the right thing, but I'm not sure if she does it for the right reasons. She lets go of Vision and Tommy and Billy who never existed in the first place and frees all the townspeople and their children. Then she is let go by Monica Rambeau. And I didn't mean that to rhyme. Now we come to the line that defines this entire series. They'll never know what you sacrificed for them. No, they won't understand what Wanda sacrificed because they'll be too busy going to therapy and taking their kids to therapy and praying they don't grow up with drug problems. Same story, different century. There will always be torches and pitchforks for ladies like us. I know, people can be so harsh. She only enslaved thousands of people. She could have enslaved thousands more. So the omnipotent psychopath gets to walk free. Once she shed herself of the family dynamic, she now has achieved full empowerment and she's going to take off and read a book in the mountains. So the moral of this tale is... If you've been victimized, if you're sad, you can be as horrible as you want to anyone. Basically, Twitter. So what happens to the kids? Well, we don't really know. Pietro or Boner mentions they might be asleep in their beds, crapping their pants because they can't go to the bathroom. Dottie mentions that her eight-year-old daughter is trapped in her room, and she mentions this right before she abandons her. Or maybe there was a throwaway line that I missed, and I don't care enough to go back and watch this a fourth time to find out. This was a total disappointment. Sure, it's unfair the expectations put on this show because it was the first thing to come out since Endgame, but it's clear what direction the MCU is going in especially after watching three episodes of Falcon and Winter Soldier. M-she-you. WandaVision had great potential, and it had some decent moments, mostly with Paul Bettany and Elizabeth Olsen. Everything else falls at the feet of the writers that Marvel hired. There are lessons to be learned that Disney Marvel will completely ignore. Number one, do not lie to your audience. Number two, do not shame your audience for coming up with better stories than the writers that you hired the third and maybe most important, when you're adapting a superhero comic book, maybe hire a showrunner who knows how to read a comic book. And again, at least the director of the show knew that they had a problem on their hands from bounding into comics. Then the truth comes out. However, the signs of troubled waters soon began to make themselves apparent. Recently, WandaVision director Matt Shakeman spoke with fandom and preemptively asserted that some fans would be disappointed with the finale. And it's such a shame because I think comic book storytelling is tailor-made for episodic 
television. I mean, who wouldn't want to see a proper Spider-Man TV series? But Marvel doesn't want to make that right now. They have skipped decades of source material, source material that would have made WandaVision a lot better, to jump into the all-new, all-different, but all-the-same homogenous Disney Marvel. The MCU is something that, believe it or not, I get criticized for once in a while, and I'm here to explain exactly what it is. No, I do not hate women. I love the character of Wanda Maximoff and Scarlet Witch and the Invisible Woman and Elektra and Storm and Rogue. I have read these characters for decades. I even like the original Monica Rambeau Captain Marvel when she led the Avengers. Unfortunately, the people that Marvel and Kevin Feige are hiring don't give a shit about the source material or comic book fans. Scarlet Witch, Vision, all of the Avengers are timeless, iconic characters to comic book fans. These are characters created by men and women who actually cared, cultivated for decades. That's why they're so popular. Unfortunately, now that they've hit Hollywood, these timeless characters have an expiration date. I'm going to close out this video talking about a friend of this channel and an absolute legend in the live stream chats around these parts. He was known here on YouTube as Mark C. His name was Steven Chere. He lost his battle to cancer a few weeks ago. He was the ultimate fan. His comic knowledge was second to none and he will be missed. My condolences to his family. Rest in peace, Mark C. While the MCU is still more good than it is bad, WandaVision is some of the worst. I wouldn't waste your time. Now, in honor of this show, because if they can do it, I can do it, here are some very long credits. NerdErotic.com, please subscribe. If you like what I do, please consider subscribing to the channel and liking and sharing the videos. It really does help. If you've come across this video and you find yourself unsubscribed from this channel, don't be surprised. YouTube recently has done a bot and old account cleanse and there's always collateral damage. I thank everyone for your continued support.